Welcome back to season two of You Should Read This, back again with Tom Van der Luba. Tom, great to see you. Hi, Richard. And, nice uh, to see you again. Yeah. And you picked this one out. Uh, so our book is Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties. Oh, like you put it there in, what's that in English and Dutch you're holding up? German. German. You read it in German. Okay. Yeah. Uh, David de Jong. Um, a 300 page book, which I actually listened to on audio, audio books with my five year old boys in the car driving around over the holiday. I've just been in. So my, my five year old <laughs> oh, now well informed about the, the, the history of the Nazi industrialists. Um, but yeah, so you picked it out, Tom. So maybe you should um, kick off with yeah, why you picked it. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I have three reasons for picking the book. One, because it's a book about history, which normally I do a lot of books for entrepreneurs and manage, managers, etc. Uh, but it's nice to make a link to history. Why? Second point, because it's about the question about, let's say, doing no harm or doing harm. And it's the whole topic of, let's say, starting point of Google, etc. But it's a topic with purpose and B Corp, which is, is back on the agenda. And the third thing is that I like, I like to put it on the agenda for the podcast because it reads like a novel. So it's, on, it's nonfiction, but it, it reads like, uh, yeah, like a novel. Uh, so, so I found it, uh, uh, I, I like to read the book and, and it is difficult um, to stop reading. Because it's just it's just an ongoing history, and you're just curious what will be next. Yeah, exactly. And the way the book is written, I thought I I didn't I didn't interview David uh, de Jong uh, yet, but I, I, when I was reading it, I thought, okay, this this looks like a kind of screenplay, and I'm really curious. One of my questions to David will be when I will interview him is, is this the goal that somebody will will buy the film scripts? Because it there's there's this. The way of, 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 of writing the book is that they sometimes they say, yeah, and then in the future, blah, 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 this will happen. And uh, at this point, we didn't know yet, blah, blah, blah. So there are some, some links, uh, which, which makes it very uh, nice to, uh, to, read, to read the book. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it centers around well, the, the patriot, the key characters of the patriarchs of, of what have become and to some extent existed at the time, dynasties, industrial dynasties uh, in Germany, and, uh, and how they initially supported the rise of, of Hitler uh, and then you know, continued to profit from their relationships with, with him and with Goebbels. Uh, that's the main thrust of the, I suppose, the narrative, and he details out some of the atrocities that they were complicit in. Um, through, through the war. Uh, I wonder if, well, maybe we could start with your, your take on, yeah, what was, what was the aspect of the, best, the book that surprised you the most or that you felt like you learned from? Yeah, I have to, I have to uh, just explain or share that I studied uh, history. I mean, I'm a historian officially. I, 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 I did a lot of diff different things, which I liked a lot. Uh, but I studied in Berlin with a big scholarship of the German government. Thank you, uh, German government. Uh, from 91, so just after the war came down, and one of the things I did in Germany was studying German history. So I studied really, let's say, not on a very su superficial way, but really dived into this topic. For instance, Historica Streit uh, and, 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 and other topics. So if people are interested in this, but also, let's say, about uh, the Second World War and this kind of stuff, also read a lot of stuff. And um, uh, I just wanted to say that, let's say, most of the stuff uh, which is in the book is known in Germany, especially, let's say, by people who are interested in the, top, in the subject. We'll dive to, uh, uh, into this. Um, but problem is if you just compare it for instance with the Netherlands is that German or German books 
are often not translated into English. So you have a lot of very specialized literature, um, also sources, but they're, they're not publicly available. Yeah, perhaps in German, but uh, that doesn't help a broader audience. So I think the main thing is, or that there are two things which I like a lot or probably are new or not new. So what is new? Probably for an, an Anglo-Saxon or American audience, there's a lot of new stuff uh, uh, or new information, which they didn't know if you are not familiar with the topic and you don't read German. What was new for me in a way was that, which, which he also describes very profoundly is that when he started to question those hairs of, I hope I pronounced it correctly, of those fortunes, and, and, and the main family, I think, which dominates the book is the family of Quant, uh, of the BMW uh, owners, uh, Stefan Klatten, uh, as an example, that what I didn't know is on the one hand that they were sponsors, I didn't realize this, that they were sponsors of big media prices. And on the other hand, I didn't realize that they never had changed the names of their found foundations and also entities which still have the name of this ancestors which collaborated with the Nazis. And, and that was new to me. So, and what I said at the beginning is that what I also find very interesting uh, is that he has all those families and then in the end he has a, a positive example or a positive exception where uh, the company Rijman or the family Rijman he, he mentions, which, which I found very helpful to see that there are different ways of dealing with your history. So what I find interesting, what I find interesting is that some families, although those people who are now in charge, they were born much later eh, than the second war, war ended. So they could have be, uh, they could act on that, but they don't. And, um, and that, was, that was really new to me. And what I also found really disturbing is, um, uh, but I didn't dive into this. I don't know how, how exactly all those reactions were in Germany. Uh, for instance, he, he says, and okay, the, the biography of Harald Quant was changed on, on, the, on this website of the foundation after he contacted them. Then he didn't get an answer. And then a couple of months later, he saw, okay, this biography has been changed, but it was still a whitewashed biography. So, so it's interesting that on the one hand, we have this idea of Germany, which is able to deal with, with their history. And, and they were, are often seen as, as, as a country and a nation, which really questions seriously their past. But if you see the establishment of those families, uh, there is a big question mark. And, and that's what I find a very interesting discussion in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few examples of, of redemption. Um, but I, th I suppose we should fill in for people who haven't read the book. Just This was something that I didn't realize was just the level of complicity amongst, I suppose, the, the, the German industrial class at the time with the Nazi party. I mean, my understanding of the, of the Nazi regime is that it was a, it was a state-led um, I suppose state-led transformation of Germany, uh, and and I hadn't really considered the fact that they may have been actively supported by the industrial class at the time, and the fact that um, a Hitler was funded by this this circle of industrialists, some of which are mentioned in the in the book, but then after the war started and they're beginning to create. Uh, concentration camps. A lot of these, what are now household names, but BMW, Mercedes, they have subcamps, what they call subcamps, so mini concentration camps on the on the campuses of these companies, um, where slave labor is used by the companies. Many of these forced labor, um, many of the people who are forced into labor. Are die as a result of this. They're extremely badly treated, and and this is all under the direction of these these companies. Uh, and and I was I was shocked by that. 
you know, I, I, I consider, I, you know, and you know about Deco and you know about Auschwitz and you know about mm. the SS officers and the movies and the, the popular consciousness is yeah. this is all state officials doing this. Yeah. But that's only a part of the picture. And that was what was the big revelation for me in the book. And as you say, many of the heirs of the, the leaders at the time of these firms uh, are not really acknowledging the reality that I've just described. And that's, yeah, that's, that's another important aspect of this story. Yeah, there has been a couple of years ago, I don't know exactly, uh, I didn't write it down, there has been uh, negotiations when Chancellor Schroeder was in power, so the guy who is now in the news because of his uh, closeness to Putin and, uh, and, uh, and the gas uh, pipeline and Gazprom, etc. There was a negotiation going on um, about, about paying those people who, who were forced to work, but it was more general. And then you still had an interesting discussion going on uh, if all the companies where there's forced labor was in place, if they would be willing to to become a part or a member in this in this solution and accepting their their guilt as a company, not not as a person at that moment moment in charge, but just as a kind of I would you could call let's say as you have a nation a kind of collective guilt also. And you can question always collective guilt. I mean, Viktor Frankl, uh, which is very interesting, was uh, was against it. He said there is no collective guilt. You only have individual guilt. Although he yeah, has survived the concentration camp, which I found one of the most interesting uh, takeaways from 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 his book. Um, uh, but at least you can, as a company, just accept when you are charged at that moment that you have a kind of collective guilt as a as a company. But even there, you had the discussion. And you're not talking about this forced labor, this kind of site concentration camps. Why wouldn't you accept this guilt? Uh, and that's what I find very interesting about Raimann. Uh, perhaps for those people, because I, I, I understood, let's say also from, the, uh, from America, that a lot of people don't know the, the family of Raimann. Uh, and from a business context, they, they produce this cargo and uh, taps for the, for the washing machines. Uh, they are the owner of Coty. Uh, that's the smell uh, stuff, etc., for perfumes and uh, and and, and uh, nutrition, etc. So and they're they're the w- the most wealthiest uh, family. I, I just I just don't dive now immediately in 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 their family history, which is probably one of the most interesting uh, stories which you you can do. But what's what's interesting is that this family Raiman also was conf- confronted with their uh, history, and then the new generation said, "Okay, uh, 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 we we feel guilty, or we accept the guilt of the guilt. Uh, we feel that we have a collective uh, or or a responsibility towards what happened under our, let's say, family company. Uh, let's say how how we behaved, and then they reserved. Uh, I don't know how hundred million and put it in the in the in the foundation and perhaps you have to explain the story if you if you know uh, which story i i am referring to but um that's what's still very strange so that 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 you have kind of truth everybody knows it and then the question is which i from 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 a present perspective perspective very interesting if i'm born in 1968 and if I would have inherited a kind of fortune, I still can say, okay, my grandfather uh, should have been put on trial in Nuremberg if he if he if he has died. I don't know, forty years ago or thirty years ago. Yeah, yeah, and I th- I suppose that's just um, for me, it's illustrative of almost the state of consciousness of capitalism right? or, or of the leaders most of or the, the majority of leaders in the comp- capitalist setting is that it's, you know, what was common amongst these patriarchs who created these industrial empires during uh, Nazi, the Nazi era is you, you hear them described over and over as cold, ruthless, calculating, right? And it's, it's the stereotype of that type that, you know, that leader who, who, is so successful in building these empires. And 
that was, I suppose, what was slightly depressing about the book was if I look around corporate leadership today, I, I don't see a huge shift in the, in the quality of leadership in general. And you're right, like there is a movement to change this B Corps and purpose driven company. But in general, it doesn't feel like the corporate class has moved on, particularly in terms of the ethics and the virtues uh, expressed by. Most of our corporate leaders, we, we, it still seems to be that the, the, the calculating ruthless type is most likely to end up in leadership positions in most large corporations. And indeed, that's what you're seeing in most of the heirs of these patriarchs who now run, fa- you know, run, run uh, family offices um, uh, to, manage, you know, to manage the wealth that they've inherited and that they to me are just illustrative of the broad you know the the broad class of industrial or you know capitalist leaders that exist today i think there are also two uh two let's say lessons or uh, let's say what you what you can take from the book is that one question is would there have been another alternative because that's always a discussion about if you talk about the war in the past. And then what I find so interesting is that, and that's also the way the book is, uh, is um, the, the, let's say how the structure of the book is. What's interesting is and that immediately, uh, uh, you're immediately in this book, there's a prologue, which is called The Meeting. And, uh, and, it, and it doesn't start with, let's say, one family. No, it starts with a meeting on Monday, February 20th, 1933, which you just, I think in the beginning, just referred to, where all those, let's say, main industrialists are invited. Uh, I think at uh, Göring, uh, Hermann Göring, um, and they, they think they will discuss, let's say, economic policy, but in the end, they are asked to pay for the election of the Nazis because they are bankrupt. So the, 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 uh, the Nazis are bankrupt, so the party doesn't have money anymore. And then after this meeting, those industrialists, they, they give money. And then the next day, I think it was Goebbels writing in his diary uh, where David de Jong refers to and says, OK, we can put on the, 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 the printing presses again. We can, we can uh, I don't know, print leaflets, etc., etc. But they were just, they were just yeah. bust. They were just bust. I mean, uh, that doesn't mean that they, they wouldn't have um, uh, been in power if they wouldn't have gotten the money. That's not the topic. But the interesting thing is there are other exemptions of people who didn't accept it. So he refers in the book very briefly, which I would find very interesting to to dive into, for instance, also with, uh, let's say, David de Jong or a search for it, Robert Bosch. Tried to uh, to 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 uh, let's say or at least he, he funded also uh, resistance etc. I mean he died during the war. And the other example which is mentioned is Fritz Thyssen, which we still know from Thyssen Group. You see them when you have elevators etc. Uh, and 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 he he ended up in a concentration camp. I mean he survived the war, but he said no, I'm not going. I'm 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 against Hitler. Although in funny the interesting thing is that in the 20s he was one of the first supporters of Hitler. But mm. that was in the context of the of let's say the problems in the Rhineland after the First World War and the French occupation, etc. But but still, the first conclusion is yeah, there you always you always have a possibility to decide for yourself, and you can't say no. I didn't have any other alternative. And the interesting thing he says is that he takes. A quote from the Quant bi- bi- biography after the World War, where somebody said, yeah, "I could have fled to uh, I could have fled to to Latin America, etc." But uh, I thought I should stay in Germany because I had to. I don't know. Uh, I felt responsible, etc. But what is the good thing of the book is that somebody, let's say David de Jong or the author, also explains that in a lot of situations they were very willing to abuse the situation by buying, let's say, on the price, those, those factories and conglomerates of Jewish 
entrepreneurs who just had to flood the country. So you also could say, okay, I can buy a steel factory. I'm not interested because it's the Jewish guy who otherwise will be murdered. Uh, I'm I'm not interested. No, no, no. They even they even and and that that was also something which I found really really disturbing, which I also didn't know in that extreme way. That he has several examples in the book where those big wealthy families just abuse the situation by saying, "Oh, I would be interested in this company. I would be interested in that company." Also abroad, where let's say uh, Germany entered Poland or or other countries. Oh, you have uh, we have Poland now. I would be interested in this steel factory, etc. And there's there's a lot of these examples, which is also disturbing. So there is always a choice, uh, uh, but they were just egoistic and tried to abuse the situation to build their fortunes. And what he shows is that those families, who still are the richest families, they really became much richer during the Nazis. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the basic sort of the moral qualities of the leaders of these families have not, in most cases, with you know, the, the Rymans accepted, are, haven't particularly changed, right? That's, that's the impression you get from the book. Uh, and, and of course, he focuses on the main characters, the, the leaders of these, of these industrial uh, firms. But the other question that I had in mind was, well, what about all of the executives? There was an entire executive class that would have gone along with this. There would have been middle managers who went along with this. So yeah. there would have been a huge cohort of, of individuals in these companies who would have had, one assumes, the means you know, to pack the bags and leave Germany or resist. You, know, that you, you, may, you may argue that there, are, there would be certain individuals on the economic breakdown who it was either I work or I you know, I die, right? I starve. But there were a, a very large number of people, one supposes, that were not in that position and could have bowed out. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not in this. I'm, I'm, not gonna hit, I'm not going to manage a company that employs slaves, <laughs> that has a com- concentration camp on site where people are dying. That's, so, so there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a huge part of the population here who are going along with this, not just within the Nazi party and within the state, but also working for these firms. And it's, this, it's as if the, you know, the majority of society were captured by this um, it, yeah, immoral wave of this new norm, this new eco- ethical norm. And it's, yeah, it's it's difficult to contemplate in a way that 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 occurred and that, but it but it did, um, yeah. And again, when you look right now at society, I'm like, could it happen again? Could it happen again in the UK? Could it happen again in the West? I'm I'm, I'm thinking, quite possibly. It doesn't it doesn't feel like we've moved on massively in terms of our moral progress. I, is that a pessimistic? I, yeah, what is interesting is that I mean I'm not I'm not uh, a specialist for American politics uh, and 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 I just don't know enough about let's say Trump and 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 uh, who is backed uh, by etc. But let's say if you if you if you just see um, interviews about the book in 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 the US, uh, there are those there are those links made to let's say, present day times. Um, but I mean, but that's probably a very difficult topic. So let's say I, 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 for instance, what I find also interesting is if just if you see in the present context, and if you would just, let's say, uh, uh, go into the future and just say, okay, what, what are the basic problems now? And what is, what, is, what, is, what is behaving as a right citizen? And what is behaving towards our our children or grandchildren, and this whole idea of sustainability. It's still interesting that this word genocide now is also used for ecocide. And they are discussing if, let's say, our way of behaving as multinationals in certain fields, it's about water pollution or chemical industry or, uh, let's say, Amazonas, etc. So you have an enormous amount of 
of of topics where we I think can really question uh, uh, a lot of topics, uh, and you don't need the whole discussion about Trump or or not, but just in general, what is the responsibility of a company towards you can call it multi stakeholder environment. Um, uh, how, how do you treat your people? How do you treat people in your value chain? How do you treat uh, people working in your factory in Bangladesh? How do you treat people uh, where you, I don't know, block uh, their access to uh, water? Uh, uh, what's your responsibility in, in, in the fossil fuel uh, industry, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's still, on the one hand, it's interesting to read about history, but I hope. That I mean, that's at least what 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 also happened when I read the book. Is okay, yeah, that's interesting history, but what does it mean for us, for me today, as having somebody who has a certain responsibility in this environment? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and one hopes that a lot of people take that out of the book is is okay. What what could I do differently? What and and how do we yeah i mean that's the question i'm left with how do we create a different society and that's the one of the things he doesn't really explore in the book and you know he's this just one book and he's he's only, he, he's focused on what he's focused on but that was what i was got interested in was why do we have why do people accept leaders like this why why is this way of operating not questioned why don't people tap out why don't why are people willing to be led in this way and and that doesn't you know that's not addressed addressed in the book, um, and and something that came to mind I know this is a bit of a tangent but I've seen re, I've seen other analyses of the of the Nazi era and people asking that question and a lot of people come back to parenting and noting that kids in that especially you know in the in the run up to the Nazi era, uh, children had been brought up in a very austere way. Um, and weren't expecting kind of empathy and kindness necessarily from authority figures, and that was and that was uh, material in terms of creating that society and that culture. And I, I I kept reflecting on that and thinking, is that a big part of the picture here? Like, how do we bring up our children, and what do they expect of their leaders and or their authority figures? And have we changed in that regard? Um, and I also thought about, you know, uh, you and I know Pim um, and um, yes. his partner, Jos, at uh, Corporate yes. Rebels. And when I interviewed Jos, he, he, uh, he mentioned how one of the reasons he thinks that he rejected corporate world and went, the corporate world and went on to create Corporate Rebels was he was brought up different. His parents were very liberal. Uh, mm. And loving, and gave him a lot of freedom, and and he got into the workplace and felt like he was, he, he couldn't recognize the leadership and the way that people were behaving in authority, and and he reacted against that. Uh, and I think that's a I think that's a big part of the picture here. Is yeah, how how are sure. we as parents? How are how are our school teachers? Um, what do we as we come into the corporate world? What do we accept of 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 leaders and what do we expect expect of leaders i wouldn't agree on that uh on the one hand one thinks that we have become more progressive but from a historical perspective to my point of view it's not true so just just if i take let's say a very simple topic is sexuality or or morals about sexuality it it's an example i often use because it's it's so easy. In the past, you could be a bastard, and 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 become a king, and it's called the bastard. Mm. A little bit child of the king wouldn't be possible anymore. I just see. Let's say you don't have to mention the English uh, yeah. royal royal family, but let's say so. Our our ideas of but if you let's say dive more into let's say present day times, and you see let's say. The ideas we had about privacy in the 60s or about opposition or about 
uh, minimum wages, etc. It doesn't matter what it is. And if I just see discussions we have now, or we also discussed um, Small is Beautiful, so this mm -hmm. whole idea about uh, ecology in the 70s. For me, the big question is, do we really progress, yes or no? And I honestly don't know the answer. Depends a little bit on my mood. So, so, so I really don't know. I, I, I think it's a kind of, kind of wave, uh, cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we have the, the idea we have become more progressive and then, 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 then uh, we think the opposite. Uh, and you also have the whole discussion about economic progress. Are we doing better or, or worse? Mm. So, but, but let's say, but that's about the, those narratives. So we think we are so, let's call it brainwashed by our, our educational system. There's a kind of linear progress in our world that we believe there is a linear progress. Perhaps there's no progress at all. If you zoom out, if you would zoom out outside of our globe and say, what are they doing at this, on this globe? They are ruining the planet. So it's not linear progression. No, it's devastating the world. So it's exactly the opposite. And you have oh, this in, yeah, in, I'm a, not lot, suggesting in, that in, in, a, in a lot of different flavors. So I also don't know if, if, if let's say, the way we behave as companies, is this, is this much better than 100 years ago? I really don't know. I mean, you can take child labor and say, yeah, we're doing much better because we have free coffee for everybody. But I don't know. Perhaps if we have, we have gotten back totally different diseases or burnouts or mental problems. I so I really don't know. Are we much happier than people 100 years ago? I really don't know. Well, well, well I know that certain, there are certain data points we can look at. So I know empathy has gone down. When they measure empathy in kids, that's gone down. Um, and also levels of depression, anxiety in the workplace we know has gone up. Um, so also now that medieval pe peasants only had to work 140 something days a year, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because the, the, uh, the feudal patriarchs at the time felt that you know, they, wanted happy, they wanted happy peasants and they, <laughs> they didn't want them working all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's, a, I, you know, I think you could certainly make the case that, you know, we, but have we got even worse since the last year? Are we even more susceptible to somebody like a Hitler coming on to, to the scene again than we were? Uh, yeah, but also let's say if you just take, if you let's say, let's say war, using war or abusing war of earning a lot of money. If we take the military into the industrial complex and then we would dive into, let's say, the amount of armaments are produced or drones or whatsoever. I think you can, I mean, I'm not a specialist on that topic, but if we would just see, let's say, what are the big weapon producers worldwide, there are probably a lot of people who are very interested in ongoing military conflicts. And we just have one in the Ukraine at the moment. And so, so, but I don't want to dive into the Ukraine. I just say, okay, if you produce weapons and if you earn an enormous amount, huh? Of, if you earn an enormous amount of money by producing weapons, it's not in your interest that, that you have a very peaceful world, to put it in a very yeah. iron, ironical way. So, and, and, and that's also something, let's say, if you take fossil fuels, at the moment, the, those fossil fuels companies earn an enormous amount of money. Their profits, they skyrocket. Uh, and, and, then, and on the other hand, you have a lot of people who can't, pay their electricity bill anymore and, and, and really are in severe problems now. So, I mean, I just want to com compare just everything with, 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 let's say, the 30s, etc. But I think if you just talk about how do we behave, sometimes there are very good examples. But I think probably you have them in all times and you have also the negative examples. And let's hope that we progress, but sometimes I really question if that's the case. Yeah, I, I, and I think we're right to question: Are we are we making any progress? Um, and but but I I think this 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 example of Ryman and these the, these heirs who are prepared to look at their past, who are prepared to face 
you know, and, and experience the pain of that, right? Accepting the the failings of our forefathers and and accepting that members of our family have done wrong and, and processing that and then making reparations where that makes sense. That's definitely the the thing to celebrate here. And I for me that's we've all got the opportunity to do that as individuals. Look into our own hearts, look into our own past, do the work on ourselves, process whatever we need to process. And and that as a uh, as an imperative for all of us um, is, a, is a point I take away from this. Right? And I suppose that's a big message of what I do with this podcast is like, go within, look at yourself, do the work. Uh, and that's, uh, that's going to give you a greater sense of who you are in the world and make it more likely that you're going to uh, resist these, these leaders. Um, and uh, and I'm not saying that I wouldn't have been any different. Maybe I'd have got along with the Nazis. Or like I'm not saying I I would have I would have been any different. But by but where I've got to, and my belief is that by doing by doing the introspective work, I become more immune to that to being led by these figures, or indeed gauging in you know in these immoral acts. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll ever be tested in my lifetime, but that, that's that's what I believe. Yeah, we, I mean, that's, that, that, that's what what's often is said. Eh? We're just very lucky that we're not in this kind of situation. So we really don't know how we would have behaved. Also, let's say you can just you can just be thankful. Uh, you, 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 you were not in this kind of situation. Uh, but at least I think there should be a discussion going on on the one hand, we should be very, let's say, critical towards those companies and just question this and say, why, if you are not responsible yourself on the individual level, why don't you accept this responsibility, especially if you know that your grandfather did what he did? Yeah, I just still don't understand. Uh, and, 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 and it's still also interesting just to dive into this in a let's say much more profound way, and and I mean the book is is in a way very complicated. So let's say, uh, or very detailed. So it's also interesting. What I find interesting is, I mean, I'm reading also the German one. Why is this mm. picture not? Why is this picture not in the English on the English one? Because so for German, those listening, yeah, yeah, you're yeah because you're... because because let's say the the Germans know this picture. So what is the, the picture for people yeah, just do, listening? Do, do, I don't know. Do you, do you know uh, which which picture this is? No, I know. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's it's, a, it's, it's because a young it's, boy and a mother and a yeah, yeah. Father, but that's, so. that's good. But that's that's what that's let's say one of the main that's the main story in the book. It's Goebbels, and 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 that's his stepson. That's Harald Quant. Okay. So 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 and and this is Magda Goebbels. So right. so 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 you have this Goebbels, the propaganda minister, yeah. and and Harald Quant, who uh, there's also a very famous picture. I don't know if I have it here. Of 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 their uh, marriage. Now I don't see it. Is but if you would Google the book, then you also see this because it's also a very famous picture where they marry and Hitler is just walking behind behind them because she was married to to Harald uh, to uh, to Quant. This is the son from her first marriage, and then Goebbels became his stepfather, and he is mm. he is he is he is the main character, which is still on the let's say uh, the name of the of the foundation of uh, of the Quant family. So, which is, let's say, it's a very, very interesting story. You can learn a lot about also those big companies. Perhaps we should also mention them. It's about Porsche. This is also the only family which was not wealthy before the war, but they, they became very wealthy after the war. I didn't know, for instance, that they started to produce the Kefir. I don't know the the Beetle or uh, this uh, yeah. this car, and that they and that they got let's say one one uh, German mark for every uh, car which was produced, or one percent. And there were millions produced, but this this idea of of building Volkswagen, uh, it's 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 uh, yeah. This is this is the picture which was also in an article where you see then Hitler. Uh, uh, on this picture, Hitler you have, and then you have this this this. Uh, Ferdinand Porsche, who the the car designer, and then they became wealthy afterwards. And in Porsche, they hired an enormous amount of SS people, 
uh, to build up the company, etc. But Porsche was the exception. But you have mainly, let's say, the richest families in 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 in, in Germany. They uh, who are wealthy before the war, and and they still are. They are uh, they are in the book. So all the car manufacturers, more or less. Yeah. Let's say all. So if you talk about Mercedes, Porsche, BMW, Volkswagen, so all the car manufacturers, which is I would say on a global scale, pretty important companies. Uh, then you have Utkar. I don't know how important they are abroad. Um, uh, I think Main Pizza, um, a producing company, etc. They have a lot of other stuff, nutrition, etc. Baking, et yeah, baking powders. Yeah. yeah. So, so you have an enormous. So you have. So you can you can listen. So if you are just interested, also in this kind of stuff, and you you have never heard of it, it's it's interesting. Then you have. Uh, uh, let's say the people who owned uh, Allianz and uh, Munich Re, uh, Utko, we already mentioned Porsche. Uh, so it's um, a flick uh, quant we already mentioned of BMW, but they also still have all the batteries. So if you have batteries and, and you buy them here, also in Germany, it's Farta. It's, and I also, for instance, that's also what I didn't know. These are the battery factories, which uh, which also became very powerful during the Second World War, and then all those steel, steel conglomerates. It's all, uh, yeah, it's all in the book, so to say. So it's, um, it's, it's just also if you just wanna wanna gain some, some more knowledge about, let's say, German industry and those car manufacturers are probably most known to everybody. It's also just interesting because there's a lot of stuff you, yeah, if you have not lived in Germany, probably don't know. Yeah. And that just a bit of trivia that Hitler had a a personal hand in designing the uh, the Beetle, yeah, right. yeah. Which I guess most people driving Beetles don't know is that uh, Hitler provided designing. But yeah, um, what is what is also let's say interesting is that there's something let's say which in general is also applicable to to uh, to the present time. Uh, uh, and I forgot to mention this, is that there's one example in the book, I think in the beginning or the end, where uh, David de Jong visits a museum in, uh, in Israel. And then, and, then, uh, and then he just sees when he is entering this exhibition that it's sponsored by and then some of those families. And then he says, no, I'm not going to walk into this exhibition. But that's, for instance, something which we see no matter in what countries. Over and over again. So you enter, you enter a kind of exposition or other stuff, and or universities, etc. And you have a strange situation that you have names of those, of those, yeah, enterprises or wealthy families, etc. And you say, oh, this is a little bit strange. So I mean, there also has has been those examples in the past. If you take the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which was built with the money of Carnegie, etc., but it's still it's 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 still also the discussion about charity. So is it is it about earning money in a wrong way and then giving it to society back as a kind of guilt? Let's take Carnegie as an extreme example. I said you shouldn't die rich, you'd give it back, but or or should be the starting point. Uh, to do no harm, uh, and 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 you see, it's still difficult. So it's difficult as a university or a museum where you don't have enough money. Just say no, no, sorry, we don't. Your we don't want your money. But if you you often see this if you enter universities or exhibitions, etc. And there's also something he mentions in the book. Yeah, and he said if yeah. people if people would know the background history of those family, and especially in Israel, it's it's it's. It's kind of uh, cynical, I would call it. Yeah, well, you've got these Nazi families sponsoring yeah, art uh, exhibitions uh, in Tel Aviv, but, yeah. but not but not changing names of their foundations and 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 not white whitewashing their biographies, but be honest and say, oh, I mean, it doesn't. There's always a question about discussion. How 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 do we do this in a proper way? I mean, if you if you have a quant foundation and and the first thing is my 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 grandfather who should have been put on trial in Nuremberg and 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 uh, hanged etc. That's perhaps not the right wording, but let's say at least at least something which 
goes in the direction of accepting your guilt would be uh, better than uh, being a sponsor in a, in a, in an exhibition in Tel Aviv or something like that. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and it goes back to this willingness to introspect, and it and it feels like it's something that we as humans are, are just resistant, right? We just th- this is what I find again and again in my work as a coach is that people it takes something for people to do the introspective work. So I, you know, I have empathy with all of these heirs who don't want to look at their past. Um, I think it's right for David de Jong to, to, to call it out, but at the same time, I, it, it's, it is, it's natural for human beings to not, to not want to look, to not want to, not want to introspect, to not want to go within. And I think, um, and, I, and that's the opportunity, I think, for each of us is to develop that capacity to do that. Um, and that, that helps us to evolve as individuals, and then that has a collective effect. I think there's one aspect um, we also have to mention because it's also mentioned in the book because the question is why were those industrialists not put on trial? Because let's say we have this collective understanding of watching the trials and uh, Adolf Eichmann and, and uh, Hannah Arendt, etc. And then, and then let's say, especially those, those Nazis were, were then uh, prosecuted, etc. And then why were those industrialists not prosecuted? Uh, I think this explained in a very uh, good way in the book, which you see over and over again, by the way, that because of the Cold War, just uh, which just started immediately more or less after the Second World War, they just said, we're not interested. We have to build up this 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 country very fast against the Soviet Union. Those are the people who understand how to do this. We're not going to prosecute them. And that's something which you see over and over again, because it's not only about the industry, it's also about all those other peoples, let's say, who are in different uh, jobs. So if you just take the courts, for instance, nobody was fired after the war because they were, they were acting as lawyers uh, in those courts. Nobody. There's also a lot written about this. Uh, politicians, the army, etc. And you have this question over and over again. So. You invade a country, you wipe out, I don't know, the government or the establishment. What are you going to do next? Let's say mm. with, with the army in Afghanistan, with the people who know how to build up an army, with, let's say, the people who were lawyers, etc. You go, you go, where do you send them? Are you going to kill them? Because they, they were lawyers uh, under the dictatorship. So it's not an easy question. Perhaps there's also something which we should add. It's not that we have to question the, the, the answers, but at least one should have to, to question this kind of stuff. And then in some cases, there are easier answers. And in other, with other questions, the answers are much more difficult. So it's much easier to say, we rename this foundation. We put money and, 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 and try to do good, uh, like, like Ryman did. And, 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 and let's say changing a whole... Uh, let's say, system in, in a country uh, which has served you know, courts, et cetera, et cetera, what are you going to do if you don't have those people? So it's not easy. That's just what I, I wanted to add, not yeah. to, to give this impression we have all the answers and because it's very easy to sit here uh, in, in, in two, uh, 2022 and then just criticize people who... Uh, who, who had to take responsibility of those decisions? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think it's an important point he makes and points out really how the most of the for the most part, with I think one exception, isn't it? Is it Von Fink who, who does go to prison? But um, yeah, they get a slap on the wrist or um, fines, small fine. Most of them, uh, yeah, walk away from it. All. Yeah, it's uh, it's an important thread in the book hmm. something that's coming to mind as we talk as well is you know if we think about solutions so we've talked a lot about oh god how you know has a society really moved on and would could the same thing happen again i, I think there's one of the things that you're doing with Vizi and you and i see it in a lot of other companies is this move away from heavy bureaucracy and and one thing that struck me although david de Jong doesn't really focus on it in the book is that most of these organizations are very bureaucratic you know, they're run by central, centralized decision makers so that these patriarchs could 
send instructions out through a very efficient and uh, a powerful bureaucracy and 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 move very large groups of human beings to do exactly as 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 these patriarchs wished including absorbing slave labor into the operation and and what it's and what i suppose what we're learning and what i've been learning through the research i'm doing doing on you know this podcast and others is that we can be very effective we can operate at scale we can have great impact in the world without the need for building bureaucracies we can have very flat organizations we can have self organizations self managed teams and it, and it's interesting for me to ponder whether or not um a non bureaucratic organization a self managed has more immunity to this kind of outside influence or these kinds of temptations to operate in you know, immoral ways and break moral codes in order to achieve a, a bottom line and and that's something that i guess i'm hopeful for i've got no evidence to just this would be true but i'm hopeful for that this movement to the extent that it exists away from bureaucratic style organizations uh does does provide some insurance against anything like this happening at least for those firms what what do you think of that do you know what the interesting thing is that you're exactly ending with the question which is the starting point of the book dawn of everything ah because it's about those narratives so the question but that will do, be the let's say the teaser for the next episode is the question really is if structures societies companies whatsoever become bigger do they have to be vertically hierarchically organized or can there be bigger let's say forms of of, of organizations or cities or whatsoever which are still organized in a horizontal way, a decentralized way, and and the solution will be in the next episode then, will, is, is this kind of horizontal decentralized structures a better guarantee to avoid the abuse of power? And that's the main topic uh, of the of Dawn of Everything. My hypothesis is that it uh, is that they are. There's some data to back this up, right? We certainly from the research that I've done is that there's much higher levels of employee satisfaction, a lot higher levels of engagement, um, and just better performance of those types of organisations. Um, we just keep it as a secret and hope people will listen to the next episodes. Whether that where translates we, where, where to them we, being where more we discuss, morally, where we you know, discuss the dawn of everything of David Graeber. That's another and question. Okay, good. Well, maybe that is that. That's that. That's a good, um, good way to leave this off. I mean, as you said, it's a, it's a it's a fascinating book. I suppose, especially if you're perhaps not German and perhaps don't know a lot of these stories because you've heard them in you know, the German press and so on. Um, it's a great book uh, as it's an easy read. Yeah. It reads like a melodrama. So there's lots of intrigue and they, the, the relationships between the players and um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's it, it, he has obviously a very a left wing bias. That was something that I did bristle at a little bit towards the end of the book. Um, he does quite a lot of analysis of how these, um, these heirs to the fortunes of, of funding, you know, right wing politics in, in Germany. Um, and, and to me, it felt the fears that he had around or that he appeared to be expressing around that. Like, I, I understand it, right? It, I mean, it was a, a right wing movement that ultimately gave rise to the Nazi regime. Um, but I, I was questioning there how much of his analysis towards the end of the book was, was down to his personal aversion, seeming personal aversion to right wing politics versus a, you know, an objective case one could make that. Um, we're, we're seeing the, the you know, the, the, these families are sowing the seeds for the next, you know, uh, the next Nazi style regime, which seemed to be the inference, right? It seemed, at least you could read that, that perhaps he was trying to intimate that that may be the case. So that, that was something I, I didn't buy. Um, so that was, but, but to be honest, the sort of political context, you know, the contemporary political 
content was only right at the end of the book for the most part. It's just a, a great romp through you know, this period of history and the characters involved. And from a, and a novel perspective, right? It's from the, from the perspective of the industrialists, not the, not the governmental leader or not the political leader. Anything to add? No, nothing to add. I think you're, uh, you're right. I hope people like to read something. Perhaps also people who normally read totally different stuff because normally we discuss other types of books. But I think sometimes it just makes sense to, to, to broaden, um, let's say, your horizon or just in general. But it also can be philosophy or history or anthropology. And next, and Dawn of Everything is also a lot of anthropology or prehistoric. A prehistorical anthropology, etc. So I think sometimes it's interesting to 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 zoom out and to go to do something different or to read something different instead of adding um, more and more of the same. And that and uh, if if people like this, then uh, then uh, yeah, that would be great, so to say. Excellent. Well. Great choice, Tom. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I uh, hope our listeners got something from this. And uh, some of you will go on to read the book. And uh, we'll see you for the next episode of You Should Read This. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Should Read This with me, Richard Atherton, and my fantastic co host, Tom van der Luba. If any of the material in this show resonated with you, if you're thinking, perhaps, how could I take these ideas? and apply them in my own leadership or, or take them forward into my own organization, then I would love to have a conversation with you about that. If that feels like that could be a valuable use of your time, then please do click on the Calendly link in the description for this episode. and That will allow you to book a slot directly into my calendar. And I hope to speak to you soon.